Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am Joe Hollywood, and once again, I am joined by Maginot's Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew Walker, what's your nickname this week? Have you guys heard that song, Mr. Brownstone by Guns N' Roses? Just one of the most weirdest songs. And of course, Axel and Slash wrote it <laughs> on, a, on a heroin bender. That's and, the name you're going with? That's right. a long and, sentence. Andrew, <laughs> Mr. Brownstone Walker. Oh, good Brownstone. Okay. I can't stand Axel's voice, but the lyrics in this song are extremely funny, and folks, check it out. All right. <laughs> you might you might have just uttered blasphemy for some people <laughs> talking about Axel Rose like that. That's right. Now, I'm kind of excited about today's podcast because over the past year or so, our topics have ranged uh, or pretty much have stuck to the theme of real life, true crime, murders and scandals and mystery in Hollywood. And this doesn't deviate too far from that topic, but... Our focus today are going to be true crimes that have been depicted in film, have been depicted in movies, and we're going to talk about uh, fact versus fiction, how accurate some of these movies have been, and uh, these movies might motivate you to do your own investigation and go down that rabbit hole as we like to do and learn more about the topic. So so I had fun. Uh, First, I... Created a list of uh, movies that were based on real life uh, true crime uh, moments, but I wanted to focus on uh, the the Hollywood true crime. So my movies kind of revolve around things that happened in Hollywood, um, but we're not limiting limiting ourselves to that. So okay. we're going to talk about um, any sort of true crime that's been de- depicted on film. Now. I'm going to start off by talking about a movie that I only learned about about a year ago, or a year ago, a week, a week ago. Uh, it's called The Cat's Meow, and I had no idea this movie existed. And so, luckily, I did a quick search and found out that I was able to watch it for free on Amazon Prime. Okay. It had some commercials in it, but I was willing to allow that. And so luckily, having discovered this movie and deciding I wanted to talk about it, I had the opportunity to sit, sit down and watch it this past weekend. And I got to say, I really, really enjoyed this movie. And I'm, I don't know if I'm angry at myself or society for not making me aware that this movie existed. <laughs> now, I will now, say... Why, why is that, Joe? Uh, yeah, you liked it that much? I did like it that well, much. And well, I'm really give, shocked. Give yourself a break. Be yeah. mad at society <laughs> not, first. <laughs> Joe, there are only 24 hours in a day. There are, there only, you go. There are yeah, only so many movies you can see in a lifetime. Well, the funny thing is, is there are movies out there that I haven't seen or haven't seen in a long time. And then when I say to myself, wow, I haven't seen that in a long time. I need to revisit it. When I do, I realize why I haven't seen that movie in a long time. They're usually pretty awful. And there's a reason why I haven't seen it. Um, but this sort of bucks that trend a little bit. Now, I will say that the title does it no favors. The cat's meow. That doesn't tell you anything about what this movie potentially is about. Yeah, an old what, slang does, phrase. What does that phrase even mean? Like it's uh, a cool person? It's, a, it was a cool slang chick? at the time in the 1920s um, <laughs> for something that was cool, hip. You know, if you like something, that's the cat's meow. I don't know what the Pro, origin of the phrase is. Some speakeasies. Um, yeah, that's the cat's meow. Um, you slip him a Mickey Finn. And within the first 20 minutes or so of the movie, somebody actually says it, and I go, oh, 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 there's the line. He said it. He said the cat's meow. Um, so that's where they got it from. But really, it, it doesn't do the movie any favors. Uh, it was released in 2001 based on a 1997 play, uh, and the movie was directed by Peter Bogdanovich, pretty um, accredited, uh, accomplished director. Uh, it has a stellar cast. Uh, Kirsten Dunst uh, stars as Marion Davies, the silent film actress. 
Uh, Carrie Elwes, who we know from uh, The Princess Bride, uh, the Dread yeah. Pirate Roberts, among other things, uh, as um, silent film uh, filmmaker Thomas Ince. Uh, Eddie Izzard, a, a, Brit- a British comedian, uh, plays Charlie Chaplin. And I, I really like the way he played Chaplin. It was just kind of reserved, like Chaplin the person, not Chaplin the buffoon or the, right. the clown. He just played Chaplin as a human being, and I really appreciated that. Uh, Edward Herman uh, as William Randolph Hearst. And uh, this is probably the one piece of m- miscasting, I would say, is uh, Jennifer Tilly appeared as Luella Parsons. Now, if you look at photos of Luella Parsons, who was a, you know, Hollywood scandal rag uh, gossip columnist, a columnist at the time, uh, she was a little rounder in the face, a little plumper than uh, Jennifer Tilly, and uh, so that I thought that Jennifer Tilly may have been miscast as Luella Parsons, but a uh, stout woman, yeah, exactly, a handsome woman, <laughs> and. Um, uh, but Luella Parsons played a, a, a major role, um, not just in the film, but in this real-life event that this movie depicts. So here here are the facts, the historical facts that this movie uh, it revolves around and tries to, to tackle. So um, the ruggedly handsome Thomas Ince was a silent film era filmmaker who made over 800 films. Some people call him the father of the movie Western. Uh, and in 1924, he was negotiating a deal with uh, William Randolph Hearst, uh, trying to encourage Hearst to use Ince's studio uh, for his production, uh, uh, film production company that he had. And so to negotiate the terms of the deal, Hearst, finding out that it was uh, Ince's birthday coming up, uh, invited him to take a cruise on his private yacht uh, off the coast of uh, California. And so... So the gathering was a multi-layered affair to celebrate the birthday, to n- negotiate this deal. And even though there's no official record of who was on this yacht, uh, f- from all accounts, it was a, a celebrity star-studded affair. And so uh, on a Sunday night, uh, they had a birthday dinner for Ince, and he had a history of uh, indigestion. There were certain foods, certain things that uh, he w- his doctor told him to avoid. But during this cruise, he kind of indulged in uh, loaded up on champagne and things that he wasn't really supposed to have. So he had a pretty serious bout of indigestion. So bad that um, they had to dock the yacht in San Diego where he where Ince was taken off the yacht and went to Del Mar to receive medical treatment. And, and as his condition worsened, he summoned his family who came to uh, the area by train and then escorted him back to his L.A. home where he died uh, in his bed from indigestion. So right there, you're like, okay, this isn't making a whole lot of sense, but okay. And so... um <laughs> Jeez. His personal uh, physician, physician uh, Ince's doctor, Dr. Ida Glasgow, uh, signed a health certificate citing heart failure as the ultimate cause of the death that was brought on by this, uh, by this indigestion. Now, we could have just left it at that and moved on. But there's all these questions. There are all these, all the speculation, rumors, innuendos. People saw things, did things. That brought everything into question. The official cause of death was uh, questioned. One of the first things that kind of stirred up a panic was upon uh, learning of Ince's death, the L.A. Times ran an article with the headline, Movie Producer Shot on the Hearst Yacht. And that was the first indication that maybe everything wasn't what it seemed and someone must have intervened because the evening edition t- changed the headline to something a little bit more mundane. Where they got that headline, I don't know. Um, I searched online to see if there's any you know, copies of that newspaper floating around on eBay or something. I couldn't find anything. So, um, But reports say that LA Times ran with that headline and then changed it for the evening edition. I hope an editor got fired for that. Yeah, right. Unless he had reason to publish that headline and And then said, 
Uh, we need you to change that. Headline. Yeah, buddy. What's your source? So yeah, not, not <laughs> fired, but silenced. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, another thing that led to uh, doubts about what had killed Ince was that um, he was immediately cremated and his ashes were scattered at sea. So it's not like you can exhume his corpse and find out if there's another cause of death. Oh, yeah, it was lead poisoning with that. <laughs> exactly. Now, all these, all the speculation that comes up, there are explanations when you dig deep. And it was basically um, Ince and his wife had agreed long before his death that they were going to be cremated upon their death. It, it fell in line with their religious okay. belief. So it's not like they were trying to conceal evidence. But the fact that he was cremated so soon after his death was like a red flag. Like, okay, we can't even examine the body now. It was an unexpected death at that, too. Yeah, exactly. Sudden and, and puzzling. Now, here are some other things that, you know, cast a shadow over this whole thing. Uh, Chaplin had a driver, a valet, and I, I hope I don't massacre this name, but uh, Tora, Toraichi Kono was Chaplin's valet who had arrived uh, in San Diego to pick up Chaplin uh, when the yacht docked. And upon going home to his wife, he said, uh, he said, yeah, I saw uh, Ince come, come off the, uh, the yacht in a stretcher and his head was bleeding, he told his wife. So here's an eyewitness who, for some reason, saw something that prompted him to go home and tell his wife that Ince was bleeding from his head. And when he told his wife, it's like that commercial, she told two friends, they told two friends, and so on and so on and so on. So now all of a sudden, word is out there that uh, Ince was bleeding from the head. Uh, So that was another red flag, if you will. Uh, Writer Eleanor Glynn who reportedly was aboard the yacht uh, said, and this is, this is verified said that everyone on the yacht had been gathered together and sworn to secrecy about the events that transpired. Now, if Ince suffered a case of indigestion and had to leave the, the yacht early, what is this? Why would everyone be pulled together and sworn to secrecy? And I have to ask this question. If you're sworn to secrecy, don't tell anyone you're sworn to secrecy. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, but that's what Eleanor Glenn said. You gaslight everybody. I mean, you set some napalm underneath them and say, all right, guys, this is a, this is what happened. Yeah. Everybody and, gather around. This is a secret oath, and I can't emphasize this enough. Do not talk <laughs> about the secret oath. <laughs> we don't today, talk about Fight Club. Today yeah. you would just say no phones. <laughs> right. Phones in your pocket. Yeah, put them in a Ziploc bag. Yeah. Uh, here's another red flag. So uh, Luella Parsons, who I mentioned a, a moment ago, uh, she was uh, working for William Randolph Hearst uh, as a, a columnist in his paper. Uh, story: The story goes that uh, after this incident and after the Ince death, uh, she was given a life con- lifetime contract by William Randolph Hearst and put into wide syndication, which made her enormously uh, popular and wealthy. Now, some people say, well, the contract went into effect before the yacht cruise, but people point to that as evidence that it was hush money, uh, and if she kept her mouth shut, she would enjoy a lifetime contract with uh, William Randolph Hearst's paper. Now, here's the movie takes all of this gossip, all of the innuendo, and paints a, a pretty cohesive tale that takes all of this, stitches it together, plays it out on the screen, and makes you believe, yeah, that's probably what happened when they start looking at all the innuendo. Okay. Uh, so what the movie depicts is, uh, and, and again, this is verified, that Marion Davies was, was having an, a, a multi-decade affair with William Randolph Hearst, even though he was married to a woman who didn't want to grant him a divorce. She liked the money and the wealth and the status. Um, so he was married but had a lengthy affair with a young Marion Davies who had an affair of her own with Charlie Chaplin, and all parties involved in this love triangle were on the yacht uh, during Ince's birthday weekend. It's not awkward at all. Right. So. Kind of like um, uh, a Natalie Wood type. 
to do. Uh, it's just very similar yeah. to that Natalie Wood <laughs> thing that um, we've mentioned is, on this podcast. What is podcast with Hollywood right? and the murder yachts? Yeah, exactly. Well, no witnesses, I guess. Yeah. So, um, you're in international water. There you go. I was yeah, about to yeah. say that. 12 miles off the coast. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Hearst was a notoriously uh, jealous man. He was uh, very, very jealous of Charlie Chaplin's relationship with Marion Davies, even though she tried to reassure him that there was nothing there. They did have a little hookup on the side. Um, and so what the movie depicts and, and what the theory was that was going around is that uh, thinking that he had caught uh, uh, in, or, I'm sorry, Chaplin and Davies together, he pulled out a pistol, shot who he thought was Chaplin in the head, and quickly realized that it was Ince who was interested in uh, Davies' career and was talking about talking to her about coming in and uh, starring in films at uh, his studio. And so the general consensus is that uh, William Randolph Hearst mistakenly shot Ince in the head, uh, had him, you know, bandaged up, taken off the yacht in the stretcher where he died several days later. He didn't die immediately. He died in his home, you know, several days later in his bed, uh, swore everybody to secrecy and somehow got away with murder. And that's what the movie depicts very convincingly. And all of these little things that I mentioned, which are out there, if you research the story, all of those little things are all depicted in the movie. The valet witnessing it uh, come off. The way the movie sets up the mistaken identity was very, very well done, where you're like, yeah, I can see that. I can see how he thought that was Chaplin. Um, so the movie does a very good job uh, as you sit there watching the credits going, this not only seems probable, it seems likely that this is the way things played out. I mean, maybe it did. Uh, let me ask you this. Luella, what was her role before she gained prominence? Was she well-known? Well, she was She was a gossip columnist, columnist, but more regional. Right. And then after Nothing this Nothing that really incident, discerned her from anyone else. Right. Yeah, I mean, there were pl- there was Hedda Hopper. There, you know, there were all these gossip columnists across the country. Um, Wouldn't it have been but... easier just to murder her than, <laughs> than, than to give her? I mean, if you're with Randolph Hurts, what's another body? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... They say that to silence her, and, and the movie makes it look like it was her idea. Like, if you oh, want wow. me to be silent, I wouldn't mind a lifetime co- contract. And it, he said, done. Is it wise to blackmail a potential murderer? <laughs> I mean. Well, she, it sounds like she held the cards. You know, she that's held nothing. the cards. So if, you're, if you've if got something on a wealthy guy like Hearst, you and might you as well. What? I think of Ghislaine Maxwell. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> She's still alive. Yeah. Yeah, we have heard find nothing it. about that. In <laughs> yeah, forever, exactly. Happened. That got swept under the carpet because well, nobody can because no one can find her stash. <laughs> right, right, exactly, well, and that's out there somewhere. Yeah, there's, um, there's you somewhere. know who would be interesting to to ask if they've seen this movie is, you know, comedian Chris Hardwick, his wife, because Why is that? her mom it, well, uh, was Patty Hearst. Oh, so okay. she's a Hearst. And oh. She's a, a model. Oh, so she's part of that family lineage. She, huh? I think she's my age, maybe born in the mid eighties. Okay, yeah. So, but cast just, me out. Just be I'm, like, hey, uh, I'm on the list now. Yeah, yeah. that. <laughs> What's but, your opinion of this movie? But you know what? I mean, that sounds. But Joe, that sounds entirely plausible, given yeah. Hollywood's history. Yeah, it really does. Like I said, when when you do your own research and you Google it and you go to Wikipedia. There's kind of an answer for everything. There's an explanation for everything. But then when you watch the movie, you're like, man, this this all fits nicely together. So I mean, could, no one will ever know the truth. Could, but, it, could Inst have eaten something that caused an allergic reaction? He slipped and fell, hit his head, and got a bl- uh, It's It's a shit. You know, it's right. a yacht. You, these are all the unsexy versions. But yeah. to <laughs> say, to, why would you be sworn to secrecy? Right, exactly. That's that. It's all these. You look at any one component of this, and you could explain it away. But when it all comes together, the valet, the secrecy, the all this stuff. When it all comes together, you're like, wow. The 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 easiest explanation is usually the right one, and this one sure sounds plausible. Joe, now I have this image of you sitting at home e- eating something, and then all of a sudden you just go, <laughs> yeah, like this. Don't like, 
and then the spoon kind of fall goes into your bowl. <laughs> well, you know this this topic, you know, is I'm fascinated with just the general topic of these Hollywood scandals, and that was one I was aware of. Um, but it was fun sitting down and watching this movie and seeing it all uh, played out on the screen, and I really, really enjoyed it. Performances were really, really good, um, just solid all the way around. Uh, I thought it was for the most part well cast. Um, Marion Davies, you know, played by Kirsten Dunst. Um, she did a good job playing Marion Davies, but when you look at pictures of Marion Davies, uh, Marion Davies had these huge doe eyes, and I would—I don't know what Margot Robbie was doing back in two thousand one, but I—I I when I look at Marion Davies, I picture Margot Robbie playing the role because she has those same big doe eyes. But um, but Kirsten Dunst did a nice job, and uh, and she witnessed the whole thing according to this movie at the end, and and I uh, was impacted by it and everything, but. Uh, yeah, so if you're into this sort of thing, Hollywood mysteries and scandals and murder, uh, if you've never heard of Cat's Meow, I really recommend it. Yeah, uh, that the, title really. Yeah. Now when you, t- when you everything that you've told me right now, I'm like, how, how did you guys pick that title? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the DVD is on Amazon. I'll probably buy it on Amazon. But if you want to watch it this weekend, uh, you can bring it up on Amazon Prime. And if you're willing to sit through a couple of commercials, you get to watch it for free. So. Cool. If you have Prime. So that's my first movie, The Cat's Meow. Really enjoyed it. Really recommend it. And so imagine those, Pete. What do you got? What do you bring into the table? Well, I decided to pick on Jack the Ripper because, you know, I'm just a sick man. Uh, <laughs> you and- know, a lot of people have a fascination with Jack the Ripper, so it's not you. That's well, good. I'm glad I'm not alone on that. Yeah. But, no, when I when I was looking at Jack the Ripper, because we were talking about uh, Hollywood uh, making films based off real life events. Now, Jack the Ripper w- was real. The identity, we'll never really know. There are a lot of theories going on about it. It's not like the murders committed by the Ripper never happened. Uh, they did happen. So there have been various uh, accounts of it. There are people that are called Ripperologists yeah. who, spe- who specialize in just knowledge of and all the lore of uh, Jack the Ripper. I own one or two books, so I'm right there with you. Right. I mean, I, and at the end of this, we'll give you. In fact, I can give you uh, give the, our audience a couple of books right now that, are, if you're looking for it, for the most accurate, based on all the evidence, based on all the data collected over time, uh, a book called "The Complete History of the Ripper" by Sugden S U G D E N and uh, Rumbelo, uh, "The Complete Jack the Ripper Story." So you can get those. You can, you can find those out there. You can look at it online, and uh, that'll probably give you a better idea of. You know, for people interested in Jack the Ripper, but the movie that I was looking at was From Hell. It came out in two thousand one. It was based off a graphic novel by Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell, and theirs was based off of a an account of Jack the Ripper called, you know, I think it was the Final Solution, and it was uh, a more grandiose take of the Ripper series. You know, that the Freemasons were involved. It was it, there was a royal scandal involved with the Prince Albert, and. Uh, uh, you know that the the Scotland Yard had to use a a psychic to try and help the the detectives out. Yeah. They, so, I mean, they didn't even have fingerprint technology at no, the time, did they? No, they didn't. But so a movie like From Hell, which was done by uh, the Hughes brothers, uh, very well done. Had Johnny Depp in it. It has uh, Heather Graham, Robbie Coltrane, uh, excellent cast. Ian Holm, Sir Ian Holm. Uh, the late Serene Home and Robbie Coltrane. Um, it was, I enjoyed the movie. But Me too. That, I, I, I thought it was really, really well done. Cinematography was well done, but they, uh, but you talk about, uh, you guys talk about uh, liberties that Hollywood takes. The, the lead detective Aberline was never as, <laughs> as handsome and skinny as Johnny Depp. The real uh, detective Aberline was in his mid forties, considered portly, didn't die of op- never had a drug problem. Yeah, that was one problem I had with the film yeah. is finding out that uh, the character's demise in the movie has nothing to do with yeah. real life. Yeah, I mean the real the real detective lived until the nineteen late nineteen twenties, mm-hmm. and in fact I was telling Joe and uh, Andrew about this. It ended up working doing work for the Pinkerton Agency, even then. So you know, it's, he didn't die of, of an opium overdose. That never really happened. Uh, you don't know of any really. Uh, uh, relationship with Mary Kelly, like they showed in the movie, 
and uh, the fact that he needed opium to have these psychic visions, they co- basically combine the character uh, who was a psychic de- uh, detective, I'm not talking about psych on <laughs> USA, but who was uh, last, I think it was uh, Rob Lee, L-E-E-S. I can n- never pronounce it. Like, I just mm-hmm. want to say Lee's, but who knows? Yeah, yeah. That sounds right. Right. And so he offered his services to Scotland Yard to help with the Ripper, de- Ripper murders, and they never really s- took it. But, you know, you take that character... And you say, well, how do we have a character that has psychic visions there? Well, introduce drugs, mind-altering drugs. And there you have it. Yeah. So that's one way they could do it. And so from hell, I give the Hughes brothers full credit for doing their research. They they made sure they, they poured over all the, the autopsy foot footage, all the data on it. And then they said, okay, let's now make a movie on it. The original uh, Detective Aberline was going to be played by an obviously an older man, and it was Sean Connery. That's who Alan Moore originally wanted. Couldn't get Sean Connery. It would have so, been a completely different movie. Right, and then ended up going for, uh, they asked for Brad Pitt. They couldn't get Brad Pitt, and then so they settled on Johnny Depp. And uh, it was just, you know, they, they go with the theory that Prince Albert had an affair with a commoner, and it was a child, it would be a big scandal. Uh, there was no real account that, the Prince Albert ever had syphilis. That was another thing that people were, mm-hmm. were saying that, or that he was a philanderer. Actually, the the more regular accounts that the people suspected that he was actually, uh, pos- he was possibly gay. This is why he didn't have any uh, sort of affairs out there. But going back to what you said about the cat's meow, given how what we've seen of how the the crown can control the message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what inspired this movie. Is that, you know, there's no shortage of theories right. as to who did it, and some are more outlandish than others. But if you're going to do a movie, do you do one about the guy who is a butcher in a working class area of Whitechapel? Or do you tell the story about the guy who's connected to the crown? That's the more compelling movie. Right. And when you think, well, how plausible is it? What led to that theory is the fact that how was this guy not caught? Was it an inside job, so to speak? Were people in positions of power protected the killer? So that's what led to And going to back to what like you yeah. said, Joe, exactly. There, If you look at individual pieces, sometimes you go, oh, okay, I can explain this away. But then when you step back and look at the mosaic of it, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Because at the height of the murders, Scott Leonard had, had basically committed ridiculous amount of resources the Whitechapel area regarding cops, street cops. Nothing was going to happen. They were not going to have another embarrassment on their on their hand. And then after the last Ripper murder, all the cop, all, all the police presence vanishes. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if they knew there's not going to be any more murders. Yeah. Oh. So when the when the when the final murder happened, then all of a sudden, it, it almost like Friday they were cops. Monday, yeah. the police presence has gone back down to normal. Hmm. How did they know? How they not? Why would you not wait a couple of months to see? Oh, is there going to be another murder? Nothing. Yeah. Wow. Everything went very quiet. And that kind of when you when you take that piece and then start looking at it from step back, you go, wait a minute. This now this starts to feel a little awkward. Yeah, yeah. It makes you wonder if you know the powers that be confronted the killer and said, "We're not going to have any more of these murders, are we?" And either shipped them overseas, which is one theory, right? Or got a uh, reassurance from the killer saying, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to do it anymore. And Scalinier also said, that, oh, the reason it had to be a commoner because that, you know, the eyewitnesses were saying that, oh, yeah, we saw a gentleman, a figure uh, in that region. So, but eyewitness testimony is one of the the worst type of <laughs> yeah. testimonies you'd ever want because people's memories change, people's accounts change, people can be pressured to say whatever they want. And they also didn't want to say, well, because there was a big, a Jewish population there, and they were concerned about anti-Semitism spreading rampantly on there. So yeah. there were things that Scotland Yard did to take away clues. There was there was the chalk on the wall. Yeah, that an incident like that did happen. There yeah. was there were the constables said, "Oh, we just need to get rid of this. That part's not important for the yeah, investigation." Yeah, and it's just going to stir things up. Yeah. Right, but then you also kind of go, "Well, is that important?" I mean, okay, maybe <laughs> it doesn't have to do with any anyone of Jewish faith or descent. It could have been something that's important for, for the clue. And because one of the only Ripper letters that can be confirmed said from hell. Yeah. And it actually had a piece of a kidney of one of the victims in there. Yeah. That was in there. So they kind of go, well, yeah, this is a sick bastard. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
like I said, there's no shortage of theories. There is one leading candidate whose name came up multiple times during the investigation. And I learned something recently that the shawl of one of the victims, I want to say Catherine Eddowes was murdered wearing a shawl. And somehow that was kept as evidence for years and years and years and years. And eventually I think it was put up for auction where a ripperologist purchased the shawl that was worn by the victim and decided to put it through a DNA test. Yep. They did get viable DNA off of it. Now critics say, um, well, that shawl has changed hands so many times there could be anyone's DNA on it. But what are the odds that one of the DNA samples that they pulled off the shawl brought up the name of one of the leading suspects? I think the odds of that are pretty slim. Right. Um, and I I, I want to say the last name of the suspect is Kaminsky. Yeah, it was a, a um, Polish immigrant. Yeah. So to me, that almost brings this whole thing to a close. But I don't think people want it to be closed. I don't think people want this to be solved. I think people want to talk about it and discuss it and dissect it and and drag the crown's name into this and everything. So that's just one of those cases where we'll, we'll never know, but it's fun to talk about. Right. That's where Hollywood fictional, you know, when they talked about the nature of the murders, big, well, because if a kidney came in, then this has to be someone who knows how to take out organs. Well, no, you could do a butcher could do that. Yeah, exactly. One of the victims, you know, it wasn't like a precision, precise surgical uh, attack. It was one, one victim had 39 stab wounds that, that comes across as rage as someone who's not in control. And the, the final victim was so butchered that they couldn't identify it. And that was Mary Kelly, right? Right. Yeah, yeah that was supposed, supposed to be Mary Kelly, that one of her ex-lovers had to come and identify through the eyes and the hair yeah. and said, yeah, that's her. Oh. Now, one, one, it's funny how you can take little eyewitness accounts and stitch that into the story of the film. The, the movie implies that it wasn't Mary Kelly who was murdered. It was a, another prostitute or right. whatever. And that that aspect of the film is based on a, a handful of accounts where people said, no, I, I saw Mary Kelly the day after the murder, right. two days after the murder. And like you said, eyewitness accounts are flawed. But the writer of this story, the filmmakers, thought that was enough to just to, creep to have a their, theory yeah. that she survived yeah. this whole thing. So it's funny how you can kind of nitpick and take different elements and, and stitch that, that into a story. And that the various prostitutes knew each other. Just because yeah. they came from the same area doesn't mean they really knew each other. And also because their names had, there were so many aliases that they would use because that's just the, na the nature of the business. Yeah. You remember how uh, grapes played a role in the movie? Yeah. And, and so that was based on a theory that grape stems were found near it, one of the crime scenes. And grapes at the time were a delicacy where right. only the wealthy can afford grapes. So the movie postulates that the killer lured the, women, lured in. the yeah. women in with the promise of grapes, this delicacy, and lured them to their death. They were high and, inclined, yeah. And so that became another catalyst for the film, that and they the killer did, may have been from high society. And they did find a grapevine or a grape stock and at one of the murder scenes. <laughs> right, right. And it was at, found by a private investigator well after, yeah. you know. And so they, they said, oh, well, there it is. I mean, well, that's not, you take, like I said, you take a kernel and you try to weave a compelling story around it. Yeah. Now, the, the number one goal of any film, whether it's fictional or based on history, is to be entertained. Yes. Or entertaining. And so, yeah, you know, it does get frustrating when you find out that a historical film or a film based on actual events will combine characters or nitpick or cherry pick, you know, certain elements. But their ultimate goal is to make an entertaining movie. So right. as frustrating as it is that sometimes they're not as accurate as they should be, you kind of almost have to say, all right, I'll allow it. You know, like Braveheart. You know, Braveheart took, took place such a long time ago that it's difficult to prove some of the aspects of the film. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, the big battle scene in Braveheart uh, was supposed to take place over the control of a small bridge. And for one reason or another, the filmmakers couldn't find a bridge and said, well, we, we can't stage this around the bridge. So they just had it in open field. So sometimes there's constraints with the production in the film that force the filmmakers to kind of 
change the actual events of the film. And so that's going to be a recurring theme as we discuss these movies here today is sometimes filmmakers make concessions and cheats to streamline the story right. and make it more entertaining. It's not like they had a, a U-boat sink the Titanic or something. That would have been, <laughs> that would have been a, bit, a bit absurd. That's going to be Tarantino's next movie. Uh, it, it might the be. revisionist Titanic story. It might be. <laughs> but when it comes to, like I said, when it comes to Jack the Ripper, From Hell, entertaining, it took is. a lot of liberties. But And there's another one, Murder by Decree, made in 1979. An excellent cast. I was telling Andrew mm. this. Had Christopher Plummer, John Mason, mm. Donald Sutherland plays the psychic. And that's Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper. So you already know it's fictional based. Like you shouldn't have to explain a murder decree could happen. I'm like, it's it's Sherlock Holmes. It can't be based on reality, my friend. Yeah. Now if I'm a Hollywood executive and young writer sits across my desk from me and says, I'm pitching an idea and I'm like, All right, let's hear it. Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper, I'm pulling my checkbook out. I'm like, that sounds like something I want to see. And now that we said it, someone's making a remake of Murder by Decree because it came out in 1979, and it's due for a remake because we're already doing 80s movies. Awesome. Maybe that'll be the the plot of the next uh, Enola Holmes movie. Are you guys familiar with Enola yes. Holmes? Uh, uh, Sherlock's younger sister, played by uh, the girl from uh, Stranger Things, I, who's excellent yeah. in that. Yeah, I heard it's a decent show. I haven't seen it. It's a, it was it's two movies. There's two. They did. Uh, oh, sequel. I thought it was a series. No, 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 no. no. They it was like a, a Netflix movie, and it was both it are was, Netflix movies. Henry yeah. Cavill. Henry Cavill plays Sherlock Holmes, and he's excellent, and he's yeah. just amazing. Yeah, yeah. All right. Does that wrap up our discussion on uh, Jack, Jack the Ripper, Ripper yeah, on film? Like, yeah, but like I said, we gave the the actual uh, sources to go go get the best history, most accurate version of it, if, if, and if. Uh, you guys want a good entertainment? Just uh, for this From Hell, there's uh, Murder by Decree, TV series-wise. Whitechapel and Ripper Street were done really well. There was an old movie called The Lodger. So everything else, I, I can't really uh, vouch for it. You can watch it on your own. <laughs> well, my vote for the most accurate Jack the Ripper story is Time After Time, oh, yeah. where uh, Jack the Ripper steals a time machine and commits his attorney or his uh, his atrocities uh, throughout time. I don't know. That sounds pretty pretty solid to me. So, the f- sad part would be that the events in this are fictionalized. You have to put the disclaimer on there. We're in a lot of trouble. Honestly, I am loosely based on actual I, events. I hate to say it, but I have not seen any of any films or that series. Fine, Andrew. I've stopped judging you for from, this. Or uh, of Jack the Ripper. Wow, and I'm fascinated. Not by not it. not one thing I've seen that you mentioned, but they. From Hell sounds good, and definitely uh, Murder by Numbers. And I'll tell you what, yeah. when we reach the one-year anniversary of our, of our show, I will not, I will, again, refrain from judging you because. <laughs> <laughs> he has a list. I mean, there's got to be a list of movies that I need to we've recommended. And I need, uh, L.A. Confidential yes. has come up many, 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 many times. times. Yeah, Every yeah. episode. I'm going to bring <laughs> that in at some Andrew, point. That's all, uh, that part is almost shameful, Andrew. That, <laughs> that, that was mentioned really on is. the pilot episode. I need, and, to, uh, I, I need to see if it's streaming on uh, the but I yeah. don't have to pay money for him, then I'll watch it. <laughs> or borrow your same. DVD. <laughs> All right, Andrew, the right. Uh, the uh, the platform is yours. So, what do you got for us? So I had to look up the year that Jack the Ripper happened. I knew it was late 1800s. So that wrapped up in autumn of 1888. Yes. Exactly 69 years later, in November of 57, 1957, in Plainfield, Wisconsin, they discovered the guy who was the inspiration for the following characters from the following films. Uh, the guy from Psycho. Um, Norman Bates. Norman Bates. The guy from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Leatherface. Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. Wow. Uh, three different guys from three different Rob Zombie movies. <laughs> and unsurprisingly, because I'm not familiar with this movie, the character Garland Green and Con Air, I don't know who... Uh, oh, the actor was that might have been Buscemi. Yeah, whoever the because, whoever the serial killer. Yeah. Okay. So Steve Buscemi played a terrifying character in that film. Okay. So this guy, his name was Ed Gein, last name G E I N. Um, for from what they know of, he was on a ten year killing and grave robbing spree. Wow. He grew up extremely poor out in the country. Um, I honestly don't even know what part of Wisconsin Plainfield is, but. Um, had an alcoholic father who split at a young age, a very overly religious and 
obviously mentally ill mother who was jealous of every other female that she would encounter, hmm. whether it was relatives or women in town. And she was very protective of wow. Ed Gein. My potential serial killer checklist is just, I'm so, just checking yeah, out things right now. So, uh, Nick, it's, it, it, it's an interesting case. I'm not going to go into the details, but he robbed at least nine graves that they know of. He confirmed, uh, murdered two women, uh, and that's what led to his arrest. But when they entered his house, they found all sorts of human uh, remains remains made into utilities and art. I'm just going to put wow. it that way. Holy moly. Um, honestly, the, the facts on the Wikipedia page are disturbing, so go into it uh, knowing that. Uh, but... Um, I, for, for a specific movie, uh, I recently re rewatched the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and realized, oh, wow, there's, there's, there, I, I, I remember here, now this might've been loosely based on somebody, but, uh, it's, this takes place in rural Texas with a chainsaw. What happened with Ed Gein took place in, you know, uh, 20 years earlier in mm -hmm. rural Wisconsin with um, non-motorized tools, as long as, as far as they know. Yeah, yeah. And in, instead of the uh, grandpa father uh, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it was his mother. Ah. Um, mm. But she passed away uh, before they caught him. So he was just a loner. After she passed away, um, oh, yeah, and his, his brother – died from uh what they suspect was a uh, blunt force trauma to the head but officially hmm. he he was burned in a field accident but later on they they said in the autopsy there was blunt for oh, yeah. force trauma to the head oh wow so it's it's inspect it, they they think it was a a Cain and Abel moment right wow and after that it just set him off this path where he, he was obsessed with uh killing people and and, wow. and mutilating so anyway, the, uh, he kills these two ladies uh, in the little town there in Wisconsin, and the police catch him fairly quickly. Um, then a couple years later, the movie Psycho gets made. Yeah. And I've caught bits and pieces of the movie from here and there, um, but obviously Norman Bates is, is based on that. And then Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out in 74, which was, the movie is just extremely visceral, and they used real... Freshly killed uh, animals like uh, cattle and real blood and mm. uh, yeah and this this movie was made on a budget of like sixty thousand dollars at the time so you can imagine well right yeah. how awful the conditions were it was filmed in Austin when it was like one hundred and ten degrees oh, out uh, for a month straight working sixteen hour days mm. so yeah wow but this this movie is it's deeply darkly darkly comedic is it it's, so, it, it well, i know i've never heard know, anyone describe that movie as comedic before. i mean it gives me i i know joe you're not the type of guy to see remind me if you've seen uh midsummer nick yeah yeah okay i see what you're saying okay this movie is filmed 90 percent like in bright daylight yeah it's kind of a you're, slow it's kind of a slow burn uh well midsummer is not as viscerally right. or except for that the one scene where the guy gets flayed out in the shed, like Yikes. like an eagle. Um, but there are a lot of influences, uh, a lot of wide shots in this movie, beautiful shots that show action going off in the distance. Uh, and so it stylistically, it is very good, uh, but the subject material is deeply disturbing. There are a lot of sociopolitical commentary, commentary sort of like Ramiro with... Uh, Night of the Living Dead and right, Dawn right. of the Dead. This, this is more of not so much consumerism, maybe a little bit of consumerism, but a little bit of um, political issues because uh, it, over the radio programs in the background, the news stories are all right. Uh, Watergate, mm -hmm. whatever's ripped from the headlines yeah, from the yeah. early 70s, uh, the oil crisis, mm -hmm. uh, uh Mass murder, you know, Vietnam, right? Vietnam plays into it, so hmm. um, it's 
the movie has a lot of value artistically, but it's just it's 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 hard to watch for those those sure, sure. visceral parts. Other than that, ah, it get I get it gets two thumbs up for me. I like it. I know it has a huge <laughs> following, and it, it's so shocking for me to to you know I'm a toy collector, and it's so shocking for me to go into like a store like Target, and they they have their adult collectible section over by the electronics, but. I'm always still shocked when I walk over there and, and see a uh, Leatherface action figure yeah. uh, on the shelf at Target. I'm like, who's buying this stuff? But I know that the film has a huge following. And and the the, the most shocking thing to come out of your, your presentation there is, is realizing how many movies uh, have exploited that yeah. Ed Gein, Gein, whatever his name is, uh, yeah. exploited that story to create more and more films like from Psycho to yes. uh, Silence the, of the Lambs. This is, and this is this. I I agree with you on on we sh- we shouldn't market this movie towards younger people. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a hard R, as it should be. It was banned in many countries, yeah. even a lot of Western countries. I think maybe the UK, they banned a lot of movies for some reason. Uh, and it's not a, it's not like a jokey. Um, I don't know. What, what would be the other opposite end of the spectrum of R rated, but I don't know it, right? Because that, that's kind of geared towards kids, or at least the I newer guess, one yeah. was. Wait, Stephen King is it? Yeah, wasn't that? I felt like the newer movie was geared. It had children in it as a, oh, as, as a okay. character, but it's, I wouldn't. Well, take, uh, anyway, you yeah. know what I'm saying. It, Pennywise, this, the clown. This movie should... Uh, it should not be. Marketing. Market, yeah, yeah. Also, the the title kind of gives it away. It checks this chainsaw. It's not like the cat's yeah. meow where you're wondering what that is. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, misleading. That a 19 year old Kirsten Dunst says the lead. At... Yeah. No. But no, you know, Psycho obviously is a classic. I I revisited it fairly recently, and uh, it's it's so well done. But that movie kind of makes some statements about possible homosexuality and things like that. Um, but there's definitely the, the theme that seems to be explored over and over and over again is that mother, domineering yeah. mother son relationship that yep. seems to surface in a lot of those types of movies. And I'm sure those were all ripped from the headlines. Um, and, you know, some of the best movies out there are ones that have some kernel of truth. Right. Because uh, you can't make that stuff up. I mean, when no, you no. read about that stuff in the newspaper, I, I can kind of see why filmmakers gravitate toward that stuff because it's like geez we couldn't hire a hundred writers to come up with something this twisted and sorted and it's, it's explained the darkness that be, people have uh, i remember fbi profilers have interviewed serial killers like ted bundy before he, you know, yeah. for um his sentencing and uh yeah they 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 fbi helped create that profile yeah. when it comes to how to tackle uh psychosis and serial killers and also uh andrew did you just inadvertently admit to not seeing psycho either i think you've seen clips of it uh, I, I have not uh, 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 it's fine hey, it's, it's fine one, i know it's one of those I just it's I, one of those i mean you know top 20 all american film classics or whatever place it's in that i just i have just saying i was paying attention list. i'm just yeah. saying i was paying attention i remember you saying that i went did you just say he saw clips of psycho so this when this guy got caught he I'm trying. Tr- let me see if I can get my facts straight. Uh, he he did. He passed away um, in 1984 at age 77. Hmm. He was not deemed to to fit to stand trial because they said that when they caught him, he he was just so far gone. Yeah, he was so psychotic that even yeah. back in the 50s or yeah, I think in the walking 60s, into his place and seeing all the stuff that you were talking they, about would kind of do that. You know, they said you know. We're not going to kill this guy. You know, we're not, not going to give him the death penalty. He just needs to be put away in a home for life. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that, that he lived out his his days there and uh, you know passed away from a uh, respiratory failure. But you, are you guys are familiar with the German uh, director Werner Herzog? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He did some documentaries. Great and, documentarian. Uh, and then there's another filmmaker who I wasn't familiar with. He he's American. His name's Errol Morris. He's also made documentaries. Yeah. These two got together. I'm just going to read it from the Wikipedia. Attempted unsuccess- unsuccessfully to collaborate on a film project about Ed Gein uh, in, mi- in the mid-70s. So the other guy, uh, Errol Morris, was able to interview 
Ed Gein several times at the mental hospital. Holy moly. So behind the scenes, Herzog and Morris thought, Let, let's, let's not tell anybody, but let's, tr- let's do an experiment. They were going to dig up his mother's grave to see if he had robbed her body. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know before he got caught. Apparently, they never followed through on it because oh, wow. Errol Morris was so disturbed by the idea. Herzog went there. He went there at uh, Wisconsin, and he was going to do it, but only if Errol Morris yeah. showed up. Yeah, I think there's so, some laws that prevent that. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, you'd have to go through some paperwork. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Imagine if, he, if they got caught. Yeah, right. And yeah. imagine how much they would be willing to show in a documentary. That's, Iron- that's Iron- a movie in itself. Yeah, ironically, they'd be charged with grave robbing. So, yeah, yeah. so because of this and because of apparently fascination, maybe Herzog himself was the reason uh, they did this, but they moved his body to an unmarked grave with the rest of his family. Yeah, you don't want so, people wor- going to his yeah, grave you, site and yeah. worshiping him. And I'm sure there's a faction out there who would, right. would do that. Right. As a matter of fact, that kind of segues into a, a current trend that I find kind of disturbing. A few years ago, uh, there was a, I don't know if it was a documentary or if it was a, a scripted uh, series, but it was about Ted Bundy. And then more recently, there was a, a series the about series. Uh, Dahmer. On and what I was seeing in social media was, hey, those guys were kind of cute. Those guys were kind of <laughs> hot. And I'm like, what did is one of wrong them, did, with you? Did one of them look like Zac Efron? Um, which one was that? Was it Dahmer? Well, I think it might, might have been Dahmer. <laughs> but they, you know, the, <sighs> when they, yeah. um, Bondi was a ladies' man. Man, he he wooed the women, and and it's it's such a disturbing trend that knowing what those serial killers did, that there's this this hero worship, and I can see if someone knew where Mister Gein was buried, yeah. that there would be tokens left there, and. I, that, it's it, such it, a disturbing trend. It's funny you mention that because Sinbad, the stand-up comic and actor, he had a thing in, in one of his uh, bits where he goes, Ted Bundy, like these serial kills. My husband's like, hey, do you want to get with me? Like, <laughs> what are they? They're like, oh, girl, he's kind of cute. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they want to get in the car. like, what are you doing? It's a disturbing trend that there's this worship out there. It definitely should not be encouraged. Yeah. No. Yeah. D- documentaries are okay, but yeah. sensationalizing it. You know, to the point where people can do it these days yeah. via mass media. Be careful. I'm in a point. <laughs> I'm in a point in my life where I try not to subject myself to that stuff. And yes. when I was younger, you know, I watched a lot of cable TV. I watched Friday the Thirteenth, Halloween, all that stuff. I kind of regret it um, because that imagery kind of sticks with me. I try to avoid that stuff today, but I'll never. Exp- uh, I'll never forget the experience I had uh, late at night one day, sitting down and watching Silence of the Lambs, huh. and. When that movie ended, I was shaking. I was I was physically shaking. It disturbed me that much, wow. and I've never seen it again. I, I and I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I'm just saying it affected me deeply, and so I I tend to stay away from that topic in in, in those movies. But there are people who just embrace it, and there are horror yeah. cons. You know, here in Michigan, there's the you know the legacy horror con that they have, and people celebrate that stuff and. Okay, that's fine if that's what you want to do, but it's just not my thing. Because that's that's a descent into a real abyss that mm-hmm. you can, you yeah, know, like those thrill yes. seekers. Because you can't become Dracula, you can't become a zombie, you, you can't. can't become a werewolf. Uh, well, not that we can admit on on this program, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Come no, no, on, you're, you're don't, give furry. The, you're don't give away the secrets now. <laughs> but when you talk about serial killers, when you talk about it, rubs the lotion on its skin or gets yeah, yeah. the hose again, or when you do, if you ever see Red Dragon. And yes, that's another yeah. which was supposed to be a prequel to Sansa. I saw Lambs. that and Henry finds in it in it the was theater and very disturbing. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. well-made movies, but disturbing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's lighten things up a little yes. bit, as light as we can get uh, with this topic. Uh, the next movie that I want to talk about is um, a movie called Hollywoodland, which came out in two thousand six. Now, this is another title that I take issue with because. It depicts events that took place in the 50s, and Hollywoodland refers to the Hollywood sign when it was a real estate development, and eventually, in 1949, the land part of the sign was removed, leaving just Hollywood behind. So why a movie that depicts events in the 50s would use the title Hollywoodland is a little confusing to me. 
you would think that that would be used to tell a story from you know pre nineteen forties. Yeah, yeah. So I have I take issue with that particular title, but it is a, a fairly well done movie. We have uh, Ben Affleck as George Reeves, uh, Adrian Brody, who is a fictional composite, uh, a detective named Louis Simo. Uh, Diane Lane is Tony Mannix, who um, George Reeves was having an affair with at the time. Tony Mannix was the wife of studio executive uh, or studio general manager Eddie Mannix, played by Bob Hoskins. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, uh, Eddie Mannix, that character was also depicted in Hail Caesar by Josh, Josh Brolin. Brolin. Yep. Um, so oh, he was kind of the, the studio fixer. fixer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And you recommended the book, I, yes. which I've been meaning to get. Um, so George Reeves was having an affair with Tony Mannix, wife of Eddie Mannix. That kind of sets the stage for one of the theories that will come later. But before we get to that, here are the facts. So George Reeves um, played Superman on television beginning in 1951. The series began airing in 1952 uh, for a total of 104 episodes. Uh, he, you know, he took it as a gig. It's, eh, it's a paycheck. Right. And he thought no one would see it. And to his shock, it was an enormous success and had a huge impact on his career. Now, despite the fact that he kind of resented his, his success, he really took his responsibility as a role model to children very seriously. Um, I read that he gave up smoking because he didn't want kids seeing Superman smoke. And so he, he really did embrace the, the role. Right. But as an actor who wanted to diverse, diversify his portfolio, uh, he was kind of pigeonholed in that Superman role. As a matter of fact, there's a scene in the movie, which is based on real life, that when he appeared, I think, in From Here to Eternity, uh, the crowd laughed and pointed at the screen and said, hey, there's Superman. So he couldn't even have a role in the film without people identifying him as Superman, which he really, really resented. Oh, it's the classic typecast, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, and so he seeked out roles, but his his contract as Superman made it difficult for him because he always had to be ready uh, to come back to the series and shoot new episodes. And, and so it impacted his ability to take stage work or other movie roles. And, and then, of course, being typecast as Superman. As a matter of fact, I was a little surprised as I was looking at his, his uh, filmography. His final appearance uh, before his death was on I Love Lucy as Superman. He uh, attended little Ricky's party as Superman. So his final entry on his filmography, he played Jeez. Superman. Um, so he faced financial hardships and every time as, as he faced these financial hardships, any opportunity that came across his desk was to play Superman. That was it. Like those were the only offers that were coming in, which, uh, again, he resented. Uh, so he was having an affair with Tony Mannix, wife of MGM general manager, Eddie Mannix, um, Reeves and her eventually split and he met this kind of celebrity hanger on called Leonore Lemon, which is a comic book name in itself. Yeah. That sounds like a character in a Superman comic. And, uh, but Reeves announced his engagement to Leonore. Um, so let's fast forward. Not too long after that on the early morning, and we're talking like one o'clock in the morning of June 16th, 1959, uh, Reeves died of a gunshot wound to the head in his upstairs bedroom of his Benedict Canyon home, which back in 2011, I kind of visited. I, I didn't go in. I just kind of stood outside and imagined what had happened in that home. Uh, the fiance Lemon reported to police that uh, she was hosting a party in the living room and uh, they heard a shot. And one, uh, one, uh, witnesses uh, description of what had happened was that lemon had gone upstairs. The party goers heard a shot. She came running down the stairs saying, tell him I was down here. Tell him I was down here, which is one theory of what might've happened in that bedroom. Um, here are some of the problems with the investigation, which was clearly botched. Uh, first of all, the gun that they found lying at the feet of George Reeves had no fingerprints on it which meant somebody wiped off the fingerprints from the gun. Who did that? Was it Leonore? Was it somebody else? Um, the bullet that killed Reeves was found in the ceiling, 
and the sh- the spent shell casing was under his body. So he fell back on the shell casing, which is interesting. Now, when police investigated and, and examined the room, they found two bullets embedded in the bedroom floor, but all party goers reported only hearing one shot. So where do these two additional bullets come from, and how long were they in the floor? When were they fired into the floor? Um, all three bullets that they dug up were all determined to be fired from the same gun, which, like I said, was found at Reeves' feet. But just uh, not at the same time. Right, exactly. The official ruling on it, after a, a hasty uh, investigation, was a suicide. Um, now, the movie, one of the complaints I have about the movie is that it it didn't take a stance. Unlike A Cat's Meow, which decided they were going to de- picked a certain series of events and they're like, here's our theory. And this is what we're sticking to. Right. The movie presents three different outcomes and depict all the outcomes on screen, which I find very odd. Like, come on, pick a theory and go with it. You know? Um, so the theories are, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now theories are that, uh, obviously one was suicide. The other, uh, the, scenario that the movie depicts is that lemon and reeves got into some sort of argument and she might have aimed the gun at him and it actually went off and, and shot him in the head the third uh scenario which i find the most interesting is that a jealous eddie mannix who was connected and powerful some say with the mob um hired a hitman to uh come into uh reeves bedroom and take him out and then exit through the window so those are the theories that are, are presented in the film. It's up to you to determine which one of any of those are correct. Um, I'd go, I would go with the latter. Yeah. I, I could absolutely believe Eddie Mannix hiring because he had connections in the police and with the underworld. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's one of the theories that are depicted in the film. Uh, again, like we said earlier, I know the movie has to sort of tell a, a linear story. So they create this uh, fictional detective played by Adrian Brody. But when you find out that he's a complete fabrication, it, it, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Like really? But I guess you have to create this fictional character to take you to certain aspects of Reeves right. life as he's investigating and hearing stories and telling it in flashback uh, that sort of tie everything together. Similar technique was used on Titanic where Rose and Jack were fictional, but it was those fictional characters that allowed us to explore the ship from first class to steerage to the engine room and everything in between. It was almost a necessity to allow us to explore every deck of the Titanic. So sometimes that's the role that these fictional characters play is, right. is to allow us to uh, see certain elements of and George Reeves' life. And the characters that were there, like the Titanic's captain, the Titanic's engineer, the... Exactly. Who was the one guy uh, that was the rich guy who wanted to... Faster, faster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was the villain in the whole thing. I'm trying to remember the guy with the mustache. It'll come to me when I'm not thinking about it. Oh, no, but... no, not, not Billy Zane. No, 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 the other one. Yeah, uh, the other guy, uh, yeah. The guy who reportedly yeah. dressed as a woman to escape off the Titanic, yeah. Yeah, so fictional characters allow them to interact with all these historical characters, and that's kind of what Hollywood land does. And... The other thing that bugged me a little bit about this film is that it was mostly shot in Ontario, uh, Canada, uh, which meant a lot of the locations that we saw were not in L.A., which, again, rubbed me the wrong way because this is a historic, uh, pretty famous story that took place in L.A. Why not shoot it in L.A.? And I guess I found out that there are some exteriors that they shot in L.A. that they use in the film, but for the most part it was filmed in Canada, and I was like, I would rather have seen this movie filmed at actual locations yeah. in Los Angeles. Look, so. You want to film RoboCop in, in Toronto and call it Detroit? Sure. <laughs> yeah, but, you can get away with it. Yeah. But this is Los Angeles. I mean, this is yeah. your, it's a backyard. Just do it. Yeah. that's a, To bring up L.A. Confidential again, and I'll be bringing it up again a little bit later, but um, yeah. they filmed in actual L.A. locations that had a long history behind these locations, and it was really cool to see that. Um, things like the Frolic Room and stuff like that, which are still there today. Um, so that kind of bugged me a little bit about Hollywood land that um, the bulk of it was filmed in Canada. But uh, overall, I found it to be a very inter- interesting movie that kind of 
brought up the memory of George Reeves and examined the, the uh, circumstances that he endured and, and what led up to those final moments. And then basically allows you to draw your own conclusion as to uh, how he met his demise. But um, really sad story that you know, here was a guy that was given an opportunity uh, for uh, fame that only that every actor can only dream of. He achieved that level of fame and and the the money that could have potentially come with it, but he resented it so much that he he poo pooed it and said, I, "I'm I'm better than that," and that led to all kinds of heartache and misery, and and um and ultimately resulted in his. Uh, suicide. Well, that's um, the biggest uh, thing with, with Hollywood, right? I mean, when Christian Bale took Batman, people were like, hey, you're going to be Batman forever. Don't do it. And he said, I'm going to prove you wrong. And so certain actors, and they can find a way. We talk about child actors with the same pressure they feel. But you're talking about characters that are for, uh, Chernobyl, the series on HBO. Yes, so uh, Uliana Komyuk, played by uh, um, Emily Watson. Mm. Yeah, that's a fictional character. But it was an amalgamation of several Chernobyl scientists to help convey it. So... Right. You're right. It just depends. So it happens. Yep. So, so yeah, so this is a really interesting movie about another huge uh, Hollywood scandal and, and death that uh, allows people to speculate. Um, maybe the answer is right in front of us, but people like to discuss it and speculate. And the home still stands today, and you can stand out in front of it and envision what might have happened that night when uh, party goers heard a, a bang. And, um, and that was it. That was the end of Superman. How about we come up with uh, a, a, a one to ten uh, system about uh, accuracy in uh, true crime movies? Joe, what would you give Hollywood Land on a scale of one to ten? As far as accuracy, well, you got to kind of rank it a little higher than most if you rule out Adrian Brody's character. The fact that they presented three different scenarios and allowed you to draw your own conclusion, they're sort of covering all their bases. Right. So I guess you got to give them some points for accuracy only because they didn't make the conclusion. They presented the theories and allow you to determine what had happened. So um, so it's it's fairly accurate. Like I said, the, the fact that Adrian Brody plays a fictional character is a big, you know, demerit. Um, wow. So that bugs me. Now, you know, we were talking earlier about the accuracy of Hollywood historical movies in general. Um, I've read that one of the most accurate Hollywood depictions of actual events is the movie Tombstone. Um, there have been many, many movies that talk about the gunfight at the OK Corral. And in one version where I think it's called the gunfight at the OK Corral, the gunfight in that particular movie lasts like 20 minutes or something. In reality, the gunfight at the OK Corral lasted about 30 seconds, and <laughs> Tombstone does a pretty good job of depicting that. And a lot of the dialogues, a lot a lot of the incident that, that happened in Tombstone, most historians agree that's exactly how they played out. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, so Tombstone is widely regarded as one of the most historically accurate Hollywood films oh, wow. ever. All right. Made. Yep. Another one I need to watch. You are kidding me. <laughs> I have not seen team stuff. Quite possibly one of the top ten greatest westerns ever made. I've, I've heard nothing but good things. Hey, I've seen Unforgiven. Does that count for anything? That, uh, for some, that's yeah. That's yeah. A, I know. I, mean, I, know I know that's Clint Eastwood, but uh, and Tombstone was what uh, Bell Kilmer. Uh, oh, Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell. I do oh, know a what couple. A cast, yeah. There, it was a, a stacked I mean, cast, but. I, there's only so many only only so many hours in a day, Nick. It's no disrespect <laughs> to uh, uh, Morgan Freeman and Clint Eastwood for Unforgiven, but that's like saying you went to Chicken and Waffles and had just the waffles. <laughs> so this is far and away better than. No, I mean, but I'm just saying or, I'm not. I'm not. When okay. you said you haven't seen Tombstone, I'm I'm at that point where uh, <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. I understand. Now there's one moment in Tombstone and also in the the uh, lesser version of events. Uh, Wyatt Earp with Kevin Costner. Yep. There's a moment in, depicted in both of those films where Wyatt Earp is in his his posse are ambushed at a creek, and guns are firing, and and Wyatt Earp's trying to get on his horse, which is bucking, and he's just had enough. And Curly Bill is in the creek, like firing a shotgun point blank at uh, at uh, Wyatt Earp, and in in Tombstone. Wyatt Earp just starts saying no, no, and he pulls his gun out and he kills everybody, and and 
you watch that scene and you're like, come on, that's a Hollywood fabrication. Imagine my shock when I read afterward that that is exactly how that played out, that Wyatt Earp, uh, the closest he ever came to getting shot is I think he found uh, a bullet in the heel of his boot. Oh, but wow. with, with Curly Bill firing point blank at Wyatt Earp and missing, and as a matter of fact, in the movie Wyatt Earp, uh, they have Kevin Costner open up his coat, and there's holes in his coat where bullets pass through his coat but not Wyatt Earp. Again, you you're, you question that and go, come on, that's a Hollywood legend. And then historians agree that's exactly how that played out. So that's what blows my mind is not only are the, the, the facts of Tombstone uh, accurate, but they're so crazy. And, and to find out that, no, that's exactly how it happened, uh, that's why it's one of my all-time favorite movies. I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, I a movie that just was redone recently and got some, a lot of Oscar attention, All Quiet on the Western Front, that based on you know historical facts and what was the perception from the German point of view, that would be one thing. A movie I'd be get, interested to get your opinion on was um, JFK, Oliver Stone's uh, JFK. When we talk about historical accuracy. I'm glad you brought that up. And that didn't even cross my radar as I was researching for this episode, but I'm glad you brought that up because... When you watch JFK, you're absolutely convinced that it was a conspiracy, that that's how things played out in real life, and you're angry that, oh, we had the wool pull over our eyes, only to find out later that is not how things played out, that a lot of that was fabrication uh, from Oliver Stone and is widely panned as a very inaccurate depiction of events uh, surrounding JFK's assassination. And when I found that out, I was angry because it's presented almost like a documentary and has you convinced that there are people responsible for JFK's death only to find out that much of that was fabricated by Oliver Stone. Is that what you've learned? That's what I'm, I'm there because now there's, I think Oliver Stone said he's going to re- release another set based on the facts that, you know, he was getting something like, okay, you know, it's almost like Wimbledon. Oliver Stone presents this thing, he gets debugged, and Oliver Stone's like, well, here's my rebuttal. I'm going, okay, Oliver, yeah. let's see what you got. Yeah, so I, I think uh, JFK would rank pretty low on the uh, historical accuracy scale. Yeah. But he did a series on that came out on Netflix. It's called An Untold uh, History of the United States, and it was a really well-done series. It had about nine or ten episodes in it, so... I think based on that, I think he was going to say, because he's consulted with historians and they're going to revisit JFK, because now they were supposed to release the files. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were supposed to have, but then... Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, they have slowly released files, but they're heavily yeah. redacted, and they yeah. don't add anything new to the conversation. Which, at this point, I'm going, you know, guys, everybody involved is dead. You can't prosecute yeah, the dead. I mean, Can we just right. release pa- this out? H.W. passed away a couple yeah. years ago, so, I mean, come on. We right, right. Start releasing the files. And then after Dick Cheney passes away, we release the 9-11 files and, you know, just keep going from there. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was one of those things with the, with the 9-11 thing. The only thing I remember is uh, one part that you talk about a little piece that always stands out. The, there's a hotel opposite the Pentagon that has a yes, camera the out there. And they can't ever, you know. Yeah, they, it was scooped up immediately. <laughs> it's just, well. Because the only thing you ever see of the plane hitting the Pentagon is it's it's, it's almost like two it, frames. Yeah, a, a, it's yeah. Uh, like oh really? Okay, I was like this yeah. is the Pentagon. We have so many cameras on it from across the bay and everything. <laughs> and this is all we can get. So you know, it's almost like when someone purposely, as a kid, hides something. With their, you can't take a look at what I have. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, what's that? I'm like, don't do that, guys. Then yeah. you just encourage conspiracy yeah. theories. Yeah. Well, well. Now, um, <laughs> speaking of historically inaccurate films, there's one more movie I want to talk about in depth a little bit about one of the, if not the most famous murder in the history of Hollywood, the Black Dahlia. Dahlia. Now, again, like Jack the Ripper, I've always had a curiosity about that particular story. People have theories as to who the perpetrator was. Um, And so back in 2006, a movie was released um, called The Black Dahlia, which was misleading. And a lot of people went to go see that movie thinking we were going to learn about the life of Elizabeth Short and the circumstances that were behind her murder. They had Scarlett Johansson in that movie. Yeah. Instead, what people got, and they were not happy about it, was the subsequent investigation following the murder 
I guess the murder, or at least Elizabeth Short, was depicted in flashback and supposedly screen tests that may or may not exist. Um, but people were angered being led to believe that this movie was going to be about Elizabeth Short, when in reality it was based on a fictional story of the investigation uh, following the, the gruesome murder. Now, the, the movie was based on a book, a 1986 book by James Elroy, who did a series of L.A. noir books that were uh, somewhere turned into films, including a little movie called, Andrew, L.A. Confidential. Oh. So, um, so there are some similarities from Black Dahlia to L.A. Confidential, which L.A. Confidential, despite being pretty much fictional, used historically accurate characters right. like uh, Lana Turner. And, and, um, and there was an incident where the police beat up some Mexicans that were in a jail. All of those were historically accurate, but they, they wove a fictional story around some of these historical events. And that sounds like that's what Black Dahlia is. Now, let me, let me say I haven't seen Black Dahlia. I really don't. I mean, I'm curious. I don't know if I'll get around to seeing it. But because of the connection to L.A. Confidential, I may get around to seeing it. But it was directed by Brian De Palma, who's a fantastic director. Uh, another great cast, uh, Josh Hartnett is Dwight Bucky Bleichart, B-L-E-I-C-H-E-R-T. Uh, Aaron Eckhart, who was uh, uh, Two-Face in the yep. Batman movies, uh, as Lee Blanchard. Scarlett Johansson is a, a new character called the K. Lake. Hilary Swank as Madeline Linscott. And uh, Mira Kirshner, beautiful actress I saw in the trailers, as Elizabeth Short in Flashback. Now, here are the facts of the actual case. Uh, and, and I'm kind of glad that the topic of this episode is allowing us to finally sort of address the story. Because when you talk about Hollywood crime scene, there's no bigger Hollywood crime scene yeah. than the murder of Elizabeth Short. It's one of the biggest stories uh, along those lines that come out of L.A. Uh, Elizabeth Short was born in 1924 in the Boston area, um, but when she found out that her her supposed dead dad was still alive and living in Los Angeles, uh, she moved out to Los Angeles in 1942 to at the age of 18 to live with him. But they did not get along well, and they frequently argued, and she ended up moving out in 1943. Uh, for a period, she left L.A., um, went to Florida and some other areas, but came back to L.A. in 1946. Uh, she aspired to be an actress. She wanted to be an actress, but researchers have found no films that she appears in. Unless she appeared as an extra, she has no credited uh, performances that you might find on IMDb. So even though she aspired and wanted to be an actress, she did no acting that anyone's aware of, uh, possibly with the exception of some of those screen tests that were referred to in this film. Right. So on January 9th, 1947, uh, Short had been visiting San Diego with a married 25-year-old salesman named Red Manley. Uh, she came back to uh, L.A. He claims to have dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel, which is a very famous hotel in L.A., and uh, that she had told him that she was supposed to meet her sister, who was visiting from Boston. Staff at the hotel reported that they saw her use the lobby phone to call somebody, um, and then uh, customers at the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge on Olive Street uh, said that she was spotted um, spending time at this uh, cocktail lounge. That was the last time she was seen alive. So about a week later, on the morning of January 15, 1947, uh, her body, uh, cut cleanly in half, was found in a vacant lot on South Norton Avenue. Uh, local resident Betty Bersinger was walking her three-year-old daughter when she th saw what she thought was a mannequin laying in a, a vacant lot. And when she realized what it was, she contacted the authorities. Um, so this is about 10 o'clock in the morning when her body was discovered. When the media got uh, word of, of this gruesome, horrific murder, uh, and as they researched and, and tried to find information about this victim, uh, a movie had come out less than a year before called the blue Dahlia. And when it became known by the press that uh, Elizabeth short hat was a raven haired beauty with uh, wore dark clothes all the time, the press supposedly coined the phrase uh, the black Dahlia, even though there was some speculation that it, it may have come from other coworkers, but it sounds fairly likely that the press made it up right. uh, because of the fact that that movie had been uh, in the public eye fairly recently. Um, 
And so the media came up with this nickname and described her as an adventurous who proud Hollywood Boulevard and um, gave her a bit of a reputation as a kind of a shady character, which, you know, the media just kind of ran with. But where, and people couldn't where did get they get that of. information if she didn't do any movies? Yeah. Well, I guess you know, as they uh, interviewed family and friends okay. and pieced together the Sister story, they kind of fabricated this sordid yeah. tale of who Elizabeth Short was, even though she hadn't been in Hollywood all that long. So I think they were just trying to sensationalize a story to sell print, you know, sell papers. Um, now, here's what's interesting, very similar. And, and again, whenever we do these podcasts, you see some recurring themes. Right. The killer, the supposed killer, sent Short's belongings to the Los Angeles Examiner newspaper and other L.A. newspapers, very similar to what the From Hell uh, Ripper killer yeah. did. So, yeah, so there's some yeah. similarities between yeah. Jack the Ripper, Elizabeth Short's murder. Um, it's yeah. weird that these... Uh, kind of cycle back. I, I think it, it's almost to the point where that the serial killer subconsciously wants to get caught. If, oh, definitely. If, if they're if they're sending hard evidence to a uh, police station or yeah. uh, journalists, or... but I mean, investigation one on one. Why her? What did she? What did yeah. she have? Yeah. What power did she have? Crime of opportunity. She probably met somebody and he invited her right. back to her place. And, and the nature quickly of the realized, was, yeah, he was, yeah, and unless. You know, there's lots of theories out there. There's there's one theory that this was a spurned lover who took out his rage and anger on her. Um, and when you think about the violence that went into this, that uh, that's a plausible theory um, that she someone not, who if, knew her did this. If she had not been cut in half, do you think this would have been, would this have made the news compared to any other guard? I hate to say it, but any kind of common... Well, I think that's what Murder. partly what helped uh, sensationalize the story, plus the fact that she was completely nude in this field. So okay. when you add the element of sex to it, yeah. then the, the, the tabloids run with it. Uh, the letters that were sent to the newspaper were like, just like you see out of a movie, they were cut out of magazines and stuff. And, wow. and you got to wonder if, if DNA was, was something back then. You know, if the, uh, the killer's licking the envelope and mailing these in, I wonder if there's some DNA evidence in a filing cabinet someplace that might pinpoint who this killer was. Uh, there's no shortage of, of suspects. Again, very similar yep. to uh, Jack the Ripper. Everyone, um, they got hundreds and hundreds of calls from people saying, it's my uncle, my father, my doctor. You know, it's like everyone had a suspect. Um, but they, they just methodically ruled out suspect after suspect after suspect. Um, supposedly one suspect uh, died in a fire after falling asleep with a lit cigarette in his hand. Um, and so again, this is just going to be one of those unsolved mysteries that unless some DNA evidence presents itself, um, we're never going to know the identity of, uh, the killer of the black Dahlia. Um, and it remains a unsolved mystery, but, uh, it was one of the first and, and biggest, um, murder mysteries in, in Hollywood history. And so, it's disappointing that the movie doesn't really get give us any answers. It basically is a fabricated story of, of the de detectives working on the case and getting going down that rabbit hole and getting obsessed with the uh, aspects of the movie to the point where one of the cops like develops feelings for a woman who kind of resembles Elizabeth, Elizabeth Short. And um, so I may get around to checking it out someday, but I'm still hoping that we may get a movie uh, down the road that gives us a better look at who who Elizabeth Short was and, and what right. may have led up to this situation. Um, obviously, again, Hollywood's going to have to fabricate some parts because nobody knows what happened to her that week that she was missing between January 9th and January 15th. Other than the physical evidence on her body, nobody knows what she went through that week. So it's all going to be speculation. And, um, you know, there are theories that she was alert and awake while a lot of this awful stuff was done to her. But... The police, based on the autopsy, think that she was killed fairly early on, and a lot of the the marks and stuff that she had on her body were was were she administered. To, uh, I don't know if she was. I'm not sure. No, actually, she's buried. I saw a photo of her tombstone uh, in I want to say Oakland, California. Uh, I think she's buried in Oakland, California. So her remains, I think, are in a coffin somewhere in Oakland, California. So I I don't know if um, they ever did a proper autopsy because. That week could tell you what what she you know where she was. Yeah. It could be you know 
Yeah, exactly. Hey, eaten. Nick, we should go Errol Morris and Brenda Herzog on it. No, I don't believe we're going to be advocating <laughs> grave robbing and grave digging yeah, yeah. on this episode just yet. Other crimes we might, because it's Hollywood crime scene, not Hollywood crime do. <laughs> um, Errol, meet me out in Oakland, California uh, next Friday. Do not bring your phone. That's right. That's right. <laughs> if you are one of Herzog, you must come with me and we will discover the truth. Now, he's the guy in The Mandalorian, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he is. Um, all right, well, we're just about out of time. We're at about 90 yeah, minutes, which is wow, uh, long yes. for us, but this was a fascinating topic. And Very much so. A couple of movies I just want to throw out, kind of honorable mentions. Um, and, and I didn't talk about this movie because we kind of did it to death, no pun intended. Uh, it was a movie Bugsy, the 1991 movie Bugsy. Yeah. We did a whole episode on the mob influence in early Hollywood, so um, you can go back and revisit that podcast if you want to learn more about Bugsy Siegel and uh, what he, the crimes he committed and his uh, his demise. Uh, and another movie I just wanted to throw out there, again, heavily fictionalized account of the Manson murders, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Um, which takes mm -hmm. historical Oh, no. Do we have 90 stories. more minutes? Yeah, I know. Yeah, we, <laughs> let's, go, let's go two hours. Um, yes. But those are movies great, you can uh, check film. out just to uh, explore the, uh, the film version of historical events uh, that discuss the uh, dark and sinister underbelly of... Uh, uh, Hollywood crime scene and um, true life crimes that were depicted on film. So, uh, guys, as you can imagine, I really enjoyed this episode yes, of absolutely. Hollywood crime scene. And uh, I don't think we've de determined our next topic. We'll have to discuss that after the podcast. But uh, we'd like to thank you folks at home for watching and listening. Thank you guys for joining me once again. And we yep. will see you next time on a future episode of Hollywood crime scene. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you.